It's the radio guy, Dr. Mike Prince, and we are on the line with our baseball guru, none other than Coach Olin Parker. Coach, happy Memorial Day weekend to you, sir, and how are you on your side of things? I'm good, Mike. Uh, happy Memorial Day to you and everybody, every listener out there. And, uh, man, it was a great week in the baseball. No doubt about it. Um, a very competitive tournament. And I'm going to reach back, OP, and go out there and say one of the more competitive tournaments that I have seen and witnessed in quite some time. And I have to give credit to the addition of Bethune Cookman and Fam You to be added in the mix. They gave you some new twists and wrinkles of things and some quality ball being played regardless of where you are on the budget scale. Absolutely, Mike. Uh, the, the, the thing about the swag tournament this year, man, everything fell in place. We had great weather, no rainouts, no delays, and uh, it just went to show you, man, the game had to be played on the field. You know, both both clubs in the championship game, Pam you had to come out the loser's bracket and Bethune Cookman. So hats off to both of those guys, and they battled yesterday, man. They had uh, 29 hits in the game, and, uh, you know, true champs came to the wood. Yes, sir. They came to the wood, and when you look at it, um, those teams, we spoke earlier today, that those teams that remained, with the exception of Gramlin, and I'm not knocking your, your Tigers or anything, but they had quality Pitch it. Now, not guys that's going to blow you out the box, throwing 90-plus consistently. But the one thing those three teams that I'm speaking of, Alabama State, FAMU, and Bethune, not only did they have depth in pitching, but they were very strong fielding teams. They minimized their errors, and they did the little things right to capitalize off of mistakes and opportunities. And it brought a different brand of ball that we are accustomed to seeing, and I know people might be hearing this, going to be saying, man, you're dogpiling. No, I'm not dogpiling, but it was exciting to hear and see that different flavor of ball being played. Absolutely, Mike. When you look at the game as a whole, you got a family end of the season at 29 and 27. That's 57 games, man, playing against a D1 schedule. And you got Bethune ending the season at 33 and 27. That's 60 games, right? You know, uh, that, that game could have been won by either team, man, but uh -huh. it's a championship game. And uh, I hope other guys on the West take note of how strong the East is because uh, there's no way we the Alabama State wouldn't be playing on Sunday. But those guys battle against each other all year, and uh, the, the best won that weekend. Whoever played the best that weekend won. And yes, sir. Either way around. If you played the next weekend, so on the West, you guys got a ways to go to catch up, man. You better get some pitching and uh, catch up, or as we said, the East is always going to be there. No doubt. Well, before we uh, go into that, that pitching, um, you got to feel for Alabama State. We, we talked about it going into this tournament, that the two teams that we felt had – the most pressure on them were Grambling and Alabama State, but more or less toward Alabama State because with outstanding, you were 41 wins in the season. You're not more than likely going to be selected when the selection show uh, continues later today on how these guys uh, are going to be playing postseason ball. It's over with for them, and that's got to be a heavy, heavy cross to bear for uh, Vasquez and the rest of those Hornets, man. Oh, yeah, they were dejected after the loss, man. But uh, like you said, you get 41 wins. I think any other conference, you get 41 wins, you deserve to play post postseason. But as we mentioned earlier, you know, because the guys playing those NAIA and D2s, the RPI is always going to kill us. And that's another reason for we need to rethink this thing where everybody play everybody where you have a regular season champion, and I think the NCAA will look at that a little stronger. Mm -hmm. You got an East champion and a West champion, and they could obviously see that the East was stronger and the West was a lot weaker. You know, it's never going to happen for us, man. It's 
it's time for the swag to shake that thing up, you know, and they say budgets, but you do it in other sports, and all you got to do is have a travel partner, your travel partner come to us, we go to other school. You know, it ain't that hard, Mike. Right. Well, they have the same somewhat set up in basketball, so I'm I'm with you on that. They can probably find a way to, to make something, uh, make some logical sense behind that. But I want to touch on pitching just for a moment. When uh, you go through the tournament games that were played and you looked at the rosters and you had some guys that were on the pitching staff, and to me it was more or less in theory than in an actual uh, participation throughout the season, but I find it a waste of space, a waste of time. If you got a guy on your pitching staff and they don't pitch ten innings throughout an entire fifty-game roster, something's wrong with that picture to me. And I know that we talk about the budget, budget, budgets, but when it comes to baseball, budgets are a part of the solution, but not all of the solution, because for the most part, whether we're fully funded or not, we all have the same uh, pieces of equipment to work with. Uh, we have allowed 11.7, some of us have seven, some of us have six, some of us even have four. And uh, we've talked about the math breakdown. If you got four, you actually got eight partials and so on and so forth that you can break things down. Well, actually more than uh, eight because you could go uh, one, one full scholarship could get you four partial players. So that would be 16 potential scholarships that you could add with the combination of uh, Pell Grants and funding. That's just where we are in this 21st century of baseball, let me just say non-revenue sports. Let's just put it like that. So when, when you look at those uh, numbers that are actuality, um, what good is it? I don't care if you are on the bottom of the D1 bracket. I believe whether in your native state or a neighboring state, there is enough quality, not about quantity, but quality pitching that you can get a guy, even if he has to bring together four guys on a partial to make up one pitching. Okay, these four guys will be for my game one, and I got some decent one and twos to mix and match where you can get some type of depth and use from your bullpen, and I'm not seeing that on most of the levels in the conference. Mike, I think they're constructing their their rosters wrong, especially on the west side. They have so much depth at every position when that's not needed. If you look at the uh, FAMU team, the infielders and outfielders, the same ones played every time, and they had all that batch. They had more pitches on their roster than position players, and mm-hmm. that's what you your roster. You don't need more than um, – you, you, I, I constructed with a starting infield with one utility man in the middle, one utility corner guy. Uh, uh-huh. In the outfield, I could go uh, maybe four, maybe five deep in outfield with two catches in the bullpen guy. Everybody uh-huh. else is pitching. The problem is these guys on the east are trying to win, win, win. They'll pitch the weekend guys. On a, on a midweek, you got to get those other guys some opportunities because in a tournament, after you pitch your starter, he's pretty much done for the tournament. Right. So you're right. giving those guys opportunities to pitch. Well, the one, the one thing that was impressive about uh, I'm getting confused either, but I think it was Bethune. They had six different starting pitches throughout this tournament. They didn't have to uh, regurgitate throughout their rotation, you know, and it might have been them or family. It was one of the Florida schools, and I was like, now that's very impressive. Now, like I stated, these guys are not topping 90-plus on a consistent basis, but there's one thing about being a thrower, and there's another thing about being a pitcher, a pitcher, I should say. Now, these guys have found pitchers from all walks, when you look at that Florida blueprint, the Texas blueprint, even the Louisiana, Mississippi blueprints, the Alabama blueprints, they're there. We talk about that Alabama State has an end inroads to uh, Puerto Rico, and that's true. But there are other pitches 
within the footprint of the said conference land of the you know layout of the land that could add significantly to your program. And once again, if I got a guy on my staff who's only thrown ten innings or less throughout a season, why is he dressed out? Absolutely. Um Mike, like I said earlier, you're not constructing their their rosters right. Um, another thing, kids want to hear they get an opportunity to play D1 baseball. I don't know what the psychic is about it. You can mm-hmm. find a walking kid that can give you some quality innings that's 85 to 90 that would be just as happy as a guy drawing 92, 93 that's on scholarship. Mm-hmm. There's a the fine guy to pitch. All no doubt about it. I got a D1 opportunity. There's a million JUCOs out of there. So those guys are not attacking it like we need pitching. We don't need arms. We need pitching. You know? Right, right. You, those guys, you, know, you look at Grambling, man, they were wasted by the time they got to Saturday. No mm-hmm. pitching whatsoever. So, mm-hmm. you know, that's when you end up getting 10 run rooms, you know? You right. got to construct a roster where my guy number. 12, 13, 14, 15 is just as important as my one and two. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. Well, as we get ready, um, I have a philosophy of what I think, you know, a pitcher. I believe every pitcher should have in their arsenal at least two pitches and a third one. A uh, fastball change up and some type of slider or curveball just for rotation. And now you can go into specialty pitches, this, that, and the other. That's fine. But I think with those three and understanding how to pitch, not once again trying to blow it past people. And I think part of the challenge is we have pitchers that want to be strikeout guys instead of being uh, – pitches to allow their defenses to work for them and that becomes part of the struggle we're not going to blow it past many people okay and you got more chances of that guy hitting that ball to one of your defenders than you striking that guy out so use that to your advantage mike i call it eight to one baseball Mm -hmm. every time you get in the box you face eight of your teammates it's easy to get out then strike them out i promise you that and on the true philosophy of pitching, you're going to get guys out more times than you strike them out. So it goes back to the philosophy of the pitching coach. You know, a strikeout happens after three strikes. You can get a guy out on a fly ball or a ground ball and one or two pitches. How about mm-hmm. that? You know, don't worry about the big strikeout. Worry about getting them out. And then you waste, you save a lot of bullets when you're getting them out in between pitch one and two. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. I had a, you got. We had a kid at Grambling that went seven and one in the conference. He drew a complete game every game, lost one game to Pine Bluff, beat everybody twice. He didn't throw past eighty four. He just got guys out. He was three quarter side on guy. He got everybody out. Just got you out. And you knew it was coming. Nothing you could do about it. <clears throat> I mean that guy there just got guys out. So you don't have to have guys throwing 90, which people want these days, and that doesn't win games. Well, I, I go back to one of the, uh, I won't say greatest, but he's one of the top savers in Major League Baseball, Trevor Hoffman. And his strikeout pitch was a changeup. <laughs> and he wasn't going to blow it past you, and you knew the changeup was coming. But with a, a strong changeup, it makes your fastball appear to be that much faster when you know how to pitch. Coach, we got a lot that we're going to be going over. And, and what I'm looking forward to, you know, we always get excited around spring, but I want to do some fall ball digging. And hopefully you'll be able to join me on this fall ball journey. Is that something possible, my man? Absolutely, Mike. Okay. Okay. Well, look, it has been, as I say, a fantastic run. Still got some more ball to be played with FAMU representing the conference. Um, They'll get their draw later today, and hopefully we can get you the information out there to let you know how they're going to be sized up and matched up. And um, a lot of work 
for the rest of the Southwestern Athletic Conference comrades to build up these programs to bring it a little bit more, as they say, um, meat to the table uh, for future games to be played. And with that, my man, I'm going to give you some closing thoughts and comments as we wrap this Memorial Day segment up. Well, Mike, it's been a great season for all, man. Um, I hope all the guys learned something about their teams and ready to put together a schedule to be more competitive where you can play on Sunday. But uh, I can be reached at Olin Parker 65 at yahoo.com. All right, at OlinParkerYahoo.com. That's my guy. I am the radio guy, Dr. Mike Prince. I want to thank you guys again. Enjoy your Memorial Day. It is truly, truly a blessing to be in a land where we can talk what we want to talk, feel how we want to feel, and don't have to worry about anyone kicking in your doors. It is our freedom statement to be a part of the land and the free Until the next time, you guys be blessed, and we'll see you on the other side.